afternoon to you. It's four o'clock time for sports for CLE. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're having a great afternoon. Uh, the Browns off season program still in the voluntary <laughs> stage. Well underway um, guys talking to the media for the first time today. Deshaun Watson is in town. Um, met with the media to give an update on his rehab as well as how he's feeling. We just put a process that can, you know, ramp up and that's just right for, you know, the right timing to come back and be able to be full go. And um, I think in this process right now, it's all about load management and not doing too much, um, even though I probably could. So, um, yeah, we just make sure that we take it a day by day um, and we do exactly what everyone came on, you know, months before got on that call and we put the plan together just to make sure we're on the right track and stand, you know, stand on the right track and not getting ahead of ourselves. I feel uh, really good. Um, very confident in myself in the process that's going. Shoulder's been really well. Um, so just making sure that I don't do anything extra that's going to harm it or, or, or anything like that. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. That's exactly what, you know, Dr. Elitrosh and the guys told me is don't try to do anything extra and rush back. So um, just follow this, the script and the, and the plan and you'll be exactly where you want to want to be even even better than before. With that, let's welcome in Tim Bielek from the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. Um, Tim, all reports, things are on track, things are going well, things are where they need to be. I mean, if, if you're the Browns, you got to be pretty happy with that, you know, considering, you know, just how, how much of a, uh, you know, crushing blow it was at the time when, you know, it was announced that Sean Watson was done for the season. But, you know, I think it's, it's, it's important, you know, the Sean Watson, like you said, is sticking to the advice of the doctors, following along with a careful plan, because there's no need to rush things. You're three months plus away from training camp, almost five months away from the start of the regular season. And, you know, with only three preseason games, they're not going to Brazil, you know, Watson could take his time a little bit, kind of work his way back into it. Kind of like what you see with pitchers when they rehab, they, you know, kind of have to take their time a little bit. I know it's not, I know it's slightly different throwing a football versus throwing a baseball, but it seems like, you know, Watson, it's he, seeing him say, you know, he, he's calm he feels like where he is, where he, where he's at, I should say with his shoulder. It's, it's good for the Browns. Like I said, that he's kind of, you know, progressing the way he is that he's able to throw again. And it just, you know, the next couple of months is, you know, how that pitch count for lack of a better term improves and how soon, you know, you know, how deep in a training camp before he can really get, you know, go full go with that shoulder. So Kevin Stefanski um, also met with the media today, talked about um, if Ken Dorsey, new offensive coordinator in the offensive staff, have started installing that new offense today and the day yesterday when they met. Sure, of course, that's what Coach Doris is doing right now with the offense and then with the quarterbacks as well, uh, trying to catch these guys up on, on a bunch of the things that we're doing. Some are the same, some are different, but Coach Doris is doing a really nice job. When you get to the practice field, some of the offensive changes, are they going to be real noticeable or more subtle? Yeah, I think it's it's a good question, Daryl. I think uh, it's probably a better question for you guys when you, you, you tell me, when, when you see it. Uh, and I think that's one of those things with us. Uh, we love to watch tape of different teams and, and steal from other teams and, and evolve and that type of thing. Uh, so there are certain things within that process that are very, very, very subtle that you may not pick up on. And it may be how, how we call things or how we rule things. And uh, for any player, an offensive lineman, a wide receiver, uh, some of their rules may change. Uh, so there, it may not be as overt. Uh, but I think it's something that happens every season in this league where you have to be evolving. You cannot stay the same. I just think the other coaches in this league are too good. You know, it will be interesting, Tim, how different the offense looks. Yeah, because, I mean, when you talk about Ken Dorsey, not only are you bringing in that fresh perspective kind of from the Brian Dable tree that we kind of seen the, the impact that uh, Dorsey has had the last two seasons in Buffalo, but another part of that is, you know, the hiring of Andy Dickerson, the offensive line coach. This was a guy they also interviewed to be off the offensive coordinator. He's out of the Sean McVay tree, so that's kind of a blending of offensive philosophies that you're putting in with what Kevin Stefanski already has in as far as the foundation, you know, four seasons into his tenure in Cleveland. So there's a lot of interesting factors at play, and, you know, how it all blends together, how it all meshes together is going to be very interesting. And it's, I think the biggest thing, you know, Stefanski, Kevin Stefanski said it best, you know, you have to keep evolving, you know, 
the basic idea is you're either getting better or you're getting worse. You can't, there's no such thing as staying in the same place and you have to continue to evolve all the time. And it is going to be interesting to see how this, this process evolves, because again, you got two new high level assistant coaches that are coming in for places that have had offensive success over recent years. Yeah. The other thing that's you mentioned, you know, Ken Dorsey in the offense. So this is the first time that Deshaun Watson and Ken Dorsey have worked together, kind of developing the offense. Um, Watson talked about working with Dorsey, why it's important, as well as what he sees in this remade offense. That's one thing you can't get back is time. And, um, you know, the time, like you said, just for me being here face to face, being able to hear his voice here. <clears throat> excuse me, hear how he communicates, hear how, um, you know, he runs things, calls things a little bit different than Kevin or AVP did la the pre previous two years. Um, you know, it's good to be around that and we can kind of communicate. He can do the same thing for him, um, you know, get around me and see how the, I operate, how I learn, what's good, what's not good, what we want to change. And um, yeah, we've been doing that the first two days. We've had a lot of conversation and a lot of meetings and um, it's been very good. But yeah, it's very, really good. I mean, a lot of opportunities for the receivers to be able to really showcase their skills. Um, a lot of guys moving around, a lot of guys being able to play different spots. Um, and then myself to just be uh, free and, and not really um, kind of controlled in a sense. It's really just gonna go out there and, and be able to, you know, showcase spread offense, throw it around, run around and, and make some plays happen. Uh, so that's um, very exciting for myself. And that gives you a little bit of a glimpse that Deshaun's, he sounds excited uh, about what he's going and seeing, at least in the early going of this offense. I think there's reason to be. I mean, you look at Ken Dorsey's background, the quarterbacks he's worked with. He's worked with Cam Noon, you know, and the Panthers were at their best under Noon when they went 15-1 and one and went to a Super Bowl. And then, you know, what he did to help develop Josh Allen and grow him into the quarterback that he is now. So there's a track record with Ken Dorsey. Obviously, being a former quarterback helps, you know, being in those in that situation where you know exactly – what an, what you're calling for a quarterback exactly what you would want if you were a quarterback there's something to be said about that and the experience ken dorsey has had you know being a play caller for you know a season and a half in buffalo i think is huge for deshaun watson and i just think you know again the I've mentioned track record before when it comes to coaches. When you see what Dorsey brings in and the success quarterbacks had, you would imagine Deshaun Watson and seeing that he's thinking, well, this is a guy this is a guy who's got a chance to try and get get him back to the level he was in Houston before you know, where he had multiple Pro Bowls and was one of the best quarterbacks best young quarterbacks in football for a handful of years. As always, play calling on the offensive side of the ball, a hot topic. Does it matter who calls the plays? No, I don't. Why doesn't it matter? Uh, because they both work together, so they both have the same mindset. They both have the the headsets and communicate. So, uh, for me, whoever calls the plays is you know going to call the plays. We, as an offense and as a quarterback, we still got to go execute and and go out there and perform. Yeah, and, and you know what? It, the more you think about it, I don't think it matters to the players who calls plays. I really don't. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's not like a play caller is inventing new plays on the ground. It's not like he's drawing up plays in the dirt on a whiteboard or anything like that on the sideline. These are all plays that they've practiced, they've studied, they've worked on for months and months in advance. So this is it's just a matter of, you know, who's saying it, you know, who's talking into the quarterback, into the hel into the helmet radio and spouting out the calls, you know. So I think that's what it is. And what we've seen with Kevin Safancy since he's coming to Cleveland, the offense has been a collaborative process. He's been the play caller, but, you know, it's been the staff that's kind of built things together over the past couple of years as far as game planning and devising schemes up. It's, you know, may the only difference is, you know, who's kind of making the who's making that call on game day. And I mean, ultimately, you know, yeah, it, I agree. It kind of doesn't matter to an extent because, again, it's the same offense. You're not changing it necessarily based on who's calling plays. And in the middle of a game, you might have to shift your tendencies towards running or adjusting. But those are things that that happen within a game. Those are things you don't prepare for. It's it's the week process, weekend process that doesn't change. It's just a matter again who's calling it on Sunday. So um, take a look at this. It's kind of interesting. Uh, both um, Christian Kirksey and Rashard Higgins signed one-day contracts to retire as Browns today. Um, you know what? That's, it's nice that they wanted to do that. Um, 
It, those are guys that, uh, now Higgins played in a little bit different era. Kirksey was a guy that played well on, uh, and played a lot on teams that just couldn't win football games. I, I think he played every snap of the 1-15 in six, one in 15 and 0-16 in seasons, which deserves some sort of medal for that. Yeah, I mean, you look at that 2014 draft, you know, everybody talks about the first round and how disastrous it was with Justin Gilbert and Johnny Manziel. But then you look at the next two picks they made, Joel Batonio and Christian Kirksey, far and away, you know, the saving graces of that draft. Batonio, obviously one of the best guards in football over the last decade. And Kirksey, like you mentioned, a very solid linebacker, kind of a shining star in what was a problematic defense for years to come. And then Rashard Higgins, of course, you know, we all remember the chemistry he had with Baker Mayfield for the first handful of years in Mayfield's career. We all remember the red carpet celebrations and the different things like that. And, you know, just just two solid, steady pros that, you know, may not have been the best players, but, you know, they, were, they had their moments. And, you know, I think it's always good to see, you know, players that you draft, especially, you know, in later rounds, the third round and, you know, the fifth round with those guys, you know, that they, that they become solid pros and that they have a contribution to the organization. And just, they've played, you know, a, a bit of a role for, in obviously the Browns turning things around from 0-16 to being where they are right now. Tim Bielek and I are going to step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break, we'll turn our attention to the upcoming draft now just 10 days away. Sports for CLA, be right back. Stay with us. Play Maximum Millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery, and you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. We continue talking Browns with Tim Bielek from the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. Uh, draft right around the corner. This is from Dog Pound Daily. The five best draft picks at number 54 overall in NFL draft history. Uh, Darian Smith, linebacker from Miami. Number four, Carlos Dunlop, edge rusher from Florida. That was by the Bengals in 2010. Number three, Jesse Bates, safety from Wake Forest, also by the Bengals, 2018. Simon Fletcher, linebacker from Houston Broncos, 1985. And uh, the top one at 54, Anquan Bolden, wide receiver, Florida State. That was the Cardinals back in 2003. So I guess the bottom line is um, there have been some pretty good players selected 54 overall. Y you give me Anquan Bolden, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Yeah, I mean, any team, you know, the last 20 years, I don't care how good your receivers are, any team would love to have an Anquan Bolden. I mean, even looking at his numbers, he burst right out of the scene and had a 1,300-yard season as a rookie for the Cardinals way back in the day. And even looking at his numbers, almost 14,000 receiving yards, 82 touchdowns, you know, over his career, any team would love to have an Anquan Bolden. You know, if you could tell, if you can guarantee, you know, whoever the Browns take a receiver at 54, that they would be Anquan Bolden. I'm sure Andrew Berry would absolutely sign up for it. But then you look at the rest of this list as well, even with recency bias, you know, Carlos Dunlap. I mean, he was such a key player for this Bengals defense for a handful of years. Just such a great power pass rusher and really a key part of why the Bengals won a handful of AFC North titles with Andy Dolan as the quarterback. And then Jesse Bates, I mean, He's, he's a stud. I mean, no question about it. Obviously, he got the big payday going to the Falcons this past offseason. There's a lot to like about him. You know, he's one of the better safeties in football. So, I mean, again, this is a list where, you know, again, plenty of guys that have had success in the NFL. Um, so, certainly, like you said, you could find great players anywhere in the draft. Even with Andrew Berry the last couple of years, we saw Martin Emerson, a third-round pick, DeJuan Jones, a fourth-round pick. You know, I feel like if you're a Browns fan – you could like you know that Andrew Bray's found guys, so you feel like there's a, a decent chance that he can find another one of those guys with a later pick. All right. Uh, I know you wrote an article. Three hot takes about the what the Browns should do in the draft. Um, number one, if the Browns stay at 54, tackle should be off the board. Uh, number two, linebacker position, one we're not talking enough about. Uh, and uh, three, um, the Browns need to draft at least one skill player on day two. Take us through your thoughts on those. 
Well, with tackle, and this is not necessarily meant to knock any of the guys who could be available, you know, at 54 for tackle, including maybe a Patrick Paul from Houston. But I think when it comes to the Browns, you're already having a log jam at tackle. You have three guys, Jedrick Wills, Jack Conklin, and Dewan Jones for two starting spots. So one of those guys is going to have to come off the bench at some point. They come off the bench this season. So you already have a log jam. Jack Conklin, you really can't move on from his contract this season. It, there really is no easy way out of it until maybe next year. DeWan Jones, there's no reason to move on from DeWan Jones as it stands right now. And with Jedrick Wills, I feel like fans are a little too eager to move on from Jedrick Wills when I think, you know, prior to his injury against the Cardinals, he's playing the he played the best football of his career possibly, you know, in those last five or six games before, you know, he suffered his season-ending knee injury. So I think they're fine at tackle. Taking one at 54 feels like too much of a luxury when you can fill some other needs. Maybe one of those needs goes to point number two is linebacker. You know, obviously, you know, linebacker is not a position that gets valued as much in this day of the analytical thought process of football because when you go five DBs, six DBs for passing situations, you're taking a linebacker out the field or possibly two in those situations. But when you look at the depth chart for the Browns, the only guy who you could see right now as kind of a long-term option is Jeremiah usu and he's in the last year of his rookie deal. I would imagine, like, the Browns should obviously do what they can to keep him around, but there really is nothing else there outside of, you know, some veteran stop gaps like Jordan Hicks and Devin Bush, and we don't know what the younger linebackers like Tony Fields and Muhammad Diabate, what, if they can be starters. So I think investing in that position is one worth looking at. And number three, Obviously, Andrew Barry has, has tried to find receivers. I think he should continue to do that. Receivers and defensive tackles are the two positions he's taken one of in every single draft since he took over as GM in 2020. So he's invested in the position. There's no question about it. I think it just hasn't worked out as far as finding that high-level starting guy that you would hope to find. Obviously, harder to do with a later pick than a first-round pick, but doesn't mean he should stop you know, swinging because we've seen so many guys with non-premium picks like Amon Ross St. Brown, you know, a fourth round pick in 2021. Puka Nakua, a fifth round pick last year. They become great receivers. So it's certainly possible. Just, And this is what I've said before is a borderline generational receiver class. Nine different guys at receiver have a chance to go in the first round. So a good one should fall at 54 or maybe in a trade down. I'd say go get them if one's there and just keep being aggressive, add another young piece to that room. And with running back, I've said before, you got to start preparing for life after Nick Chubb. So maybe, you know, a running back, you know, in the third round makes a lot of sense. Maybe in the second round, if you want to take Jonathan Brooks from Texas, that makes sense. But I think Andrew Berry needs to leave Friday of the draft with at least one skill position guy. All right. Before I let you go, I know you, you addressed this um, on an edition of the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. Which edge rushers and defensive tackles do you think fit the Brown scheme the best that are in this draft? So names to listen out for that you think make sense for the Browns. Well, I wrote about this guy as well for uh, this morning. Uh, one guy, Jonah Ellis from Utah, you know, 248 pounds, so not a big guy, but I think, you know, with him and another guy, I'll mention Austin Booker from Kansas. He's not a big guy either, you know, only about 258 pounds. But what I think, 50, 253 pounds, excuse me, for Booker. But what I think about these two guys is they're smaller guys. Then, you know, add some burst off the outside. Jonah Ellis has an outstanding three-cone time. I think it's like 6.69 seconds. That's fat, That's 0.2 seconds faster than when Max Crosby ran in his combine. And who wouldn't want to have a Max Crosby in the defensive line? Not saying Ellis is going to be Max Crosby, but I think you see some of those traits there. You know, the flexibility, the hand usage. You know, he has a nonstop motor. He's got good length for the position. And I think in a wide nine, that you can get away with having smaller edge rushers. Austin Booker, you know, I, I there's a lot to like about Booker as well. Still kind of new to the position, only had about 500 plus career snaps in college football. But you know, in his first true season, getting reps at Kansas, eight sacks, 12 tackles for loss, decent wingspan, about six, almost six eight wingspan for a guy who's you know six four. So he's got pretty good long arms. Similar traits to Jonah Ellis. So I think either of those guys, you know, maybe early third round, the Browns are able to have a pick in that area. I would look at those guys. Defensive tackle, I've said before, you know, the yeah, Chris Jenkins from Michigan is also one of my guys I will look at. But I talked a lot about Mike, Mike Hall Jr. from Ohio State. People around here obviously know plenty about Mike Hall. He was a Streetsboro alum. You know, obviously, Browns fans, they love their Buckeyes. And there's reason to with Michael Hall. You know, from the second he stepped on the field, I, you never forget, you know, the game against Notre Dame. He was sensational in that game. 
the first one in 2022, I should say, disruptive pass rusher in the interior. And I think, you know, he obviously took care of one of one of his concerns, I think, was his weight. But he grew to 299 pounds at his pro day. So he's got more pro ready size than you would think. Almost, you're not going to turn 21 till June. So a very young guy that you can kind of draft and develop behind the scenes for a year. Another guy, maybe a little older, more of a hybrid guy, Brandon Dorless from Oregon. You know, he's already 23 years old, but he's a young 23, turns 23 in March. Kind of a more of a hybrid guy, but, you know, another guy who plays a lot of power. He's got length. Kind of, one of those, kind of one of those hybrid guys, similar to Logan Hall two years ago, I believe was the second-round pick of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You know, a guy that's very powerful and tough to handle for tackles, quick for guards. Maybe you draft him and kind of take him, let him develop his body, defensive tackle for a year, and then, you know, kind of unleash him in 2025. But, you know, Dorless, I would look at more as like a mid to late third rounder. Michael Hall, I would go late second. Tim Bielek, PlainDealerCleveland.com, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Tim. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Have a good day. Tim Bielek, make sure you check him out. Always really good stuff, uh, especially with the draft and free agency. PlainDealerCleveland.com. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We continue talking Browns. Jared Mueller from Dogs by Nature, straight ahead. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. Play Maximum Millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery. And you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. I am powerful beyond my wildest imagination. I will define my future. I will keep challenging myself to improve. Because I am a future leader of this great nation. I will be responsible for raising a beautiful family. And educating not only my generation, but many more to come. I will make a difference in my community and I will stand up for what I believe in. I will not settle for simply chasing my dreams, I will achieve them. Because I was given a chance. An opportunity. A home. At Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. The ultimate leadership experience. FCCLA has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. It's made me who I am today. Join us, we'll build a new future together. We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE. Deshaun Watson met with the media today, talked um, about how involved he will be uh, when they get on the field in OTAs. When we get to OTAs and the team gets on the field, do you expect to be able to participate at least in some of those practices? Uh, that's the plan. Um, you know, we, we talked previously about that. Um, I think we got to see how these next couple of weeks go. Um, I know for Dr. Elitrosh, he, he wants to be a little bit more conservative. Um, just because, you know, it is a, it was a joint, you know, the Glenn Noy labrum. Uh, so he wants to really make sure that we're not doing too much. And other experts that was a part of it um, said the same thing. You know, this is a, a injury that you, you know, for spring, you know, you want to be a little bit more conservative. And, uh, you know, this summer and get ready for training camp, that's when there's going to be a time where we can pick that up. So um, I think he can go either way for, for that in the next couple of weeks. So welcome in Jared Mueller from Dogs by Nature. Jared, everything we're hearing um, about and from Deshaun Watson sounds like things are almost exactly where you'd want them to be. It sounds like it, but I think that's the first time we've heard 
from anyone that it's such a unique injury, right? This is not an injury that we're used to dealing with. He says the words, I'm not going to pretend to try to say medical words. Um, and so it's just important to realize that this is a unique injury. This isn't an ACL. This isn't, a, you know, this isn't some other thing that we're used to dealing with when it comes to NFL injuries. So it sounds like he's in a good place, but we won't know really anything and nothing really matters right now. Anyways, uh, until we actually see him on the field, he's able to throw the ball, get some zip on the ball. And then obviously from there, it's taking hits and some of the things that we won't see until maybe a preseason game, more likely not until week one. Yeah, that's very fair. Um, you know, he was asked again about throwing, throwing the football and, you know, could he really cut loose? I've been able to throw. I think it's still early to really let go. When you say let it go as far as like, you're talking like 50 yards downfield or? Speed. Yeah, yeah, I'm throwing full speed. Everything is fluid motion, no hinging or, um, and when I say hinging, you know, my release point when I'm throwing and things like that. Everything is fluid and um, motion is really good. The velocity and the strength is really good. Um, so it's been, it's been well. And again, yeah, I mean, it's more of a baseball injury was the other thing that we, you know, and we've tried to find there is not a quarterback who's had the injury. At least if there is, Dr. Google has not allowed us to find him. <laughs> well, and I think the other thing that was interesting today is it sounds like there's some possibility that he had this injury longer than, mm -hmm. than the Ravens game. And so it's also possible that it leads to some of maybe why he was hesitating and why there wasn't sometimes the zip on the ball and some of those kind of things. And the reality is, is the quarterback needs to be able to react and to, to do things. And so maybe, and again, I'm, I'm not looking for excuses. I am looking for hope. And so maybe that's one of the reasons he had some struggles earlier in the season. Um, I believe the Arizona game is the first game. They think he might've got that injury. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he develops and, and what do we see in year three, right? It feels weird to say year three, you know, since we haven't even got a full total season of, of Deshaun Watson play. All right, let's uh, turn our attention to the draft. This is from PFF. Uh, most underrated prospects in this year's draft. Uh, they go with wide receiver Troy Franklin. Franklin averaged 3.32 yards per route in 2023, more than half a yard higher than Brian Thomas Jr. Franklin a fringe first-round player, but his draft stock should be higher than that. Blake Corum, running back, Michigan. If the last tape we had on Blake Corum was his 2022 season, he would be viewed differently. That season, Corum earned a 96.2 grade, marginally, marginally outgrading Bijan Robinson, um, who was the best running back prospect to come out in years. And Jermaine Burton, wide receiver, Alabama, as receiver, does everything well with athleticism, nuance to his game to be a threat at all levels of the defense hasn't had overwhelming production of other receivers in this class but that has largely been down to opportunity uh, which may be affected by his relationship with coaches at multiple college programs um, when you look at any of those do any of those guys intrigue you for the Browns potentially I love Troy Franklin he's someone I don't understand why he is a late first early second round kind of placement I think he has number one receiver type skills especially again one of the things we're, we know more and more is placement uh, opportunity learning coaching growth all that really decides almost more than than a player's talent at this point in time when it comes to the draft and so I think Troy Franklin uh, developing behind Amari Cooper and Elijah Moore and along with Deshaun Watson and David Njoku and Jerry Judy, I think there's a lot of ability there, uh, whether he'll be available or not. The wide receiver group is so deep this year that I think you're going to see some wide receivers fall later into the second round than they should based on talent, only because there's a lot of options out there. And there's not a lot of options at some other positions. So maybe teams decide to take that tight end or, you know, take that cornerback where that's a little less depth at the position and then hope to get a wide receiver a little later. So Troy Franklin is someone who I would love to see. Um, Blake Corum is an interesting running back. Uh, I love that these were the three names uh, because Blake Corum's an interesting running back. He's the J.J. McCarthy, right, of running backs in that there's a question about whether or not he's really that good or is it Michigan, right? Is it the offensive line? Is it 
uh, you know, Harbaugh's ability to kind of game plan the running game, you know, and then did he get too much mileage, right? Is he, is, is he a little more worn down than you want from a running back? Uh, in again, a, a running back group that doesn't have the high end talent that the wide receiver group does, but definitely has some depth there mid to late second round, all the way down into early fourth round. Uh, I could see Corum falling just from kind of that overthinking of the running back. He's also not the biggest guy in the world. Uh, so I think there'll be some questions there. Burton, he's a player for two reasons that I would say the Browns, I can't say this for sure, uh, but I can say the Browns are probably lower on than most teams. Uh, the first is obviously what's said there at the end, his relationship with co- coaches at multiple college programs. There is a personality issue with Burton. There's also some off the field issues with Burton uh, that just creates some concern for the Browns. Uh, and for a lot of other teams. And then the second is what's called market share. While he may not have had the best quarterback play and he may have played with some other players that are good at the wide receiver position, it's rare that a receiver gets such low percentage of targets and receptions on a team and then is successful at the NFL level. Generally, the idea is if, if your college team ain't throwing you the ball, there's probably a reason for it. And your NFL team's probably not going to want to throw you the ball either. So uh, those are three really interesting players uh, that I think, you know, again, I agree. Franklin should go a little higher. Corum and Burton are going to be lower than people really realize for a, a few variety of reasons. Some may be valid. Some may be impression. Jared Mueller from Dogs by Nature and I are going to step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break, we'll continue talking draft. Uh, we turn our attention at the beginning to wide receiver. Interesting fact about wide receivers in the draft. Sports for CLA, be right back. Stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as academic all-stars and teachers of the month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K through 12. Is your K-12 school developing students' literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the School of the Year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. We continue talking Browns with Jared Mueller from Dogs by Nature. Jared, I I know you wrote an article, um, and and we've talked a little bit about this. Browns have ignored the wide receiver position early, and we're defining that as the first two rounds in the draft. longer than anybody in the NFL but the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I think the last guy the Buccaneers took was Mike Evans in the first round. We had Corey Coleman. Who won, who won that one? <laughs> yeah, you have to wonder. It's really interesting that Andrew Barry was on the staff that drafted Corey Coleman back in 2016. The Browns have, listen, they've, they've invested, right? Amari Cooper trade, Jerry Judy trade, Elijah Moore trade. But even those, the Elijah Moore trade was – a flip of second round picks, um, you know, down to to a lower one. Um, everything else, the Judy trade, the Amari Cooper trade, we're talking, you know, third day three picks. And so the wide receiver position is just a position where the top level guys, even at a higher level than some of the other positions in the first and second round, tend to be more successful. And so, uh, you know, listen, Andrew has spent a few third round picks, a few, David Bell, Anthony Schwartz, Cedric Tillman, but in this draft, whether it's in the second, maybe the third round, just given the depth of it, it feels like they're right to really get one of those guys, the guys that can develop into number one receivers. No matter what, those three guys we talked about, Tillman, Schwartz, and Bell, no one thought they were going to be number one guys. In the first and second round, you tend to be able to find that guy. And if you're not going to pay Amari Cooper 20 some plus million starting next year, you're going to need to develop that guy. You're going to have to find that guy. And so I think the Browns, given it stood out to me, right? It stood out that them and the Bucks have gone the longest without a wide receiver. At least the Bucks had Mike Evans. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Uh, I know you wrote another article. I'm interesting uh, to, to hear the rationale. NFL draft losing its importance for a few reasons, and it's not just for the Browns. Take us through that. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, is and this is where some of the lexicon and the, the wording we use around the NFL, it'll take a while to change. But we've talked about building NFL teams has to come through the NFL draft. And the reason for that has been very, very simple. Young players, cheap contracts. That's it. At this point in time, we have the lowest underclassmen coming out this year that we've ever had because of NIL, because of COVID regulations, because of the transfer portal. College prospects now have a lot of options. So they can look as a 20, 21 year old. They could either go to the NFL, hope they're drafted in the third or fourth round, hope they get these opportunities, or some school is going to pay them a million dollars to come to their school, transfer over be the number one receiver, get their hype up a little bit more, and then hope that they can be drafted then at 22 years old. We have 24-year-olds in this upcoming draft that are expected to be drafted in the first and second round. So in general, when we look at age, you, you think about ceilings. The older the prospect, the more likely they hit their physical ceiling. So all of a sudden, you have a 24-year-old who, if they're a first-round pick, their second contract starts when they're 29. Right, A 23-year-old, their second contract starts when they're 28. So all of a sudden, we don't have as young of players coming out with kind of that ability to develop uh, what they're kind of going to become. They're coming out more kind of guaranteed. Now, that's not true for the top prospects, right? The Marvin Harrison Juniors of the world, the Caleb Williams of the world, those kind of top 15, 20-some picks, they're probably going to be the young guys. But after that, college prospects have a lot more options to make decisions whether to come out or not. You're going to see a lot of older prospects moving forward, a lot of seniors, uh, all of that. The second reason is the salary cap. Cheaper is no longer as important. While the rookie wage scale is decided by the salary cap, all of a sudden teams don't have to really dedicate as much time and energy to these draft picks to be successful because they can just replace them. They have an extra five, 10, $20 million just laying around for veterans who they know that they can produce. So no longer, I mean, we saw Kenny Pickett, Trey Lance, both of those first round quarterbacks traded after two years with their teams. Justin Fields was just traded. So teams, because of the expanding salary cap, Joe Banner actually put out a tweet about it. Teams don't have to be focused on cheaper talent anymore. It's great if it hits, but they have the ability to really build their roster just through free agency. All right, um, another article that you wrote. Uh, Nick Chubb of this year's draft, at least in two ways. Um, take us through that. Yeah, so we're not trying to kind of get, you know, go too far in the hyperbole or clickbait. Uh, two of the things that Nick Chubb has done a lot in the NFL, stack boxes, explosive runs. So Nick Chubb, along with Derrick Henry, have the most eight-man boxes basically since they've come into the league. And Nick Chubb has had a, a lot of explosive runs. He's near the top of the league in number of explosive runs, even including last year, which he only played in obviously a game and a half, Nick Chubb still has led the league over the last three years in explosive runs. Well, Audric Estime out of Notre Dame, when you look at his stats from college, that's exactly what we see. There's this beautiful graph in that article, so please check it out on Dogs by Nature, but Estime is up in the top right corner, which is most eight-man boxes and most explosive runs. So. That's the kind of running back Nick Chubb has been. Estime didn't test out the way many people expected. He looks really, really fast on the field. He has all those explosive runs, but his, his testing hasn't been there. So we could see him available there in the fourth round. And he's someone who I am going to take a risk on. Uh, given a lot of what we saw at Notre Dame. Yeah, I, I, again, I've, I've said this a number of times. For whatever reason, I saw a lot of um, Notre Dame games this year. He, I, I couldn't believe he ran like a 4-7 at the Combine. It was, he, he, you're right, he looks much faster. Um, all right, 2024 Browns draft focus now or later. This is a, another one of your articles on Dogs by Nature. Yeah, I think this is just something that's really interesting to me as as a mental health person, as someone who's, you know, un, trying to understand the brain. Andrew Berry last year spent a lot of his his draft selections on future, right? Dewan Jones wasn't supposed to play. Cedric Tillman, Siaki Ika, you know, it was a lot. Luke Whipler, like that's a lot of the the one that was supposed to play the most was Cam Mitchell, 
right? And so that's a lot of kind of future-oriented picks. The reality is the Browns roster doesn't have a lot of space. So now they have six draft picks. Uh, I'm trying to remember the Leroy Watson trade that they now have an extra seventh round pick that we have to kind of figure out. I keep saying five. The reality is, is I think Andrew Berry is in a unique position to either focus on right now, trade up, make decisions about players who are ready to go right now, or is he going to go back to let's keep pushing the can down the road, go with younger players, maybe trade into next year's draft instead of drafting players this year because the roster doesn't have a lot of space, right? So it really does feel like a lot of the picks we're going to be able to place into one basket or the other. He spent a lot of time on later in his first few years on the job. I'm wondering if this year we see a little bit more of an emphasis on do we get a wide receiver that can produce right now? Do we get a linebacker that can help out right now? Can we get those players? Jared Mueller from Dogs by Nature and I are going to step aside, take one more time out. Other side of the break, we'll hear more from Deshaun Watson and Kevin Stefanski, plus every team's biggest draft steal from the past five years. Sports for CLA, be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. We continue talking Browns with Jared Mueller from Dogs by Nature. Um, we've heard from Deshaun Watson. Everybody's talking about the pressure that's on Deshaun Watson this season to perform at a high level. Uh, Watson seems really comfortable with the high expectations. I don't hope for anything. I mean, my, my expectations is, is super high. Um, and just like everybody else that is a part of this team, a part of this organization, fans, everyone has high expectations, especially for me. And being the quarterback, being the type of player that I am, being the the NFL player I am. So I think the expectations is high. I don't think that is a secret. Um, so for me, is to go out there and perform very, very high to lead us to an opportunity to go get the ultimate goal. And But first, it starts now in the spring, building that, leading into a training camp, taking care of our business in the division, and then, uh, you know, we'll see what happens when we get that opportunity um, in the big dance and, and see where we go from there. But, you know, that's a long ways from here. We got to focus on, you know, what's right now and being present in a moment. But I don't have any hopes. I know exactly what I'm capable of doing and, and, and being. And, you know, we just got to go out there and have the opportunities to do it. Jared, um, again, it just seems real comfortable with the – he he knows more than anybody. A lot's expected of him. Yeah, and it's not new for Deshaun, right? At Clemson, he had all those responsibilities. You know, Dabo Sweeney compared him to the Michael Jordan of the NFL. You know, the Texans traded a bunch to, up to get him with the Browns. The Browns traded a bunch to get him, right? He understands the expectations of what he's supposed to do. And he does seem like, and you can almost kind of watch him over the, the first three years with the, with the Browns, more and more just getting comfortable with his role and who he is and, kind of shutting out the noise a little bit and just focus on himself. Like he is a guy who really does believe in himself. And in the end, it's going to rise and fall with him. Last year proved the Browns have the the floor without a great quarterback. He, de- he decides the ceiling of this team. Yeah, without question. Well said. Um, for them to get to where he wants, to, they want to go, he has to play well. Um, he has to play as well as he can. Um, Kevin Stefanski talked about expecting more from the defense in year two under Jim Schwartz. Schwartz hit that with the defense uh, yesterday as well. It is year two in the system, so you're building off of a lot of what we did last year. And there's varying levels of understanding. There's some guys that are second-year players uh, in the NFL. Uh, And then there's Rodney McLeod. There's Denzel, guys that have been in this game for a little bit. So uh, all of them can brush up, uh, if you will, on the system. And then we're going to challenge them. We're going to, obviously, in year two, you're going to add some things and maybe subtract a few things. But we'll challenge each one of these guys, whether they were here uh, previously or not. Jared, we've talked about it. It's fair to expect the defense to be better. 
in year two in a system. It is. They were really good last year. I think the problem is, is when they run into, and they ran into it with the Texans, when they ran into, run into an offensive scheme that is willing to adjust and make changes specifically to attack that defense, Jim Schwartz kind of has this, we're going to be really good at what we do. And we're going to, that's what we're going to do. But unfortunately, some of that aggressiveness got taken advantage of. Like the Texans just basically saw what the Browns do. You know, the, the tight end screen to uh, Brevin Jordan. Um, that was literally, they waited for JOK to green dog blitz, leak the tight end out, touchdown. Here we go. Right. So it'll be really interesting. Do we see some adjustments to the flat out all in, go for it? Um, you know, hair on fire. Do we see a little bit more of a calm defense, which may not work as well in the, the regular season, but might be less apt to be taken advantage of in the postseason? All right, before I let you go, this from Total Pro Sports. Every team's biggest draft steal from the past five years. For the Browns, they go the aforementioned Jeremiah Wusakoromoa, our linebacker, has been a force in the front seven, working with Miles Garrett, earning his first career Pro Bowl nod after 2023, telling three and a half sacks, six passes defended, and 101 combined. Uh, tackles. Kind of interesting. You, you know, we've talked about linebacker. It's a linebacker they traded up to uh, to get. Yeah, JOK has been everything that we expect. Like, obviously, I don't mean this flippantly. Like, the fact that he had some some teams mark him for a heart concern, allowed him to drop into that second round, and the Browns are able to pick him up. JOK has shown that he can do a little bit of everything, right? He can get after it in the run. He can rush the passer. He can play in coverage. He's aggressive. He's a leader. He's a quality person in the community. Like, he's all of those things. And so the fact that a second-round pick is a steal is telling about how really good JOK is and maybe that the Browns haven't had, you know, DPJ was probably the only other quote-unquote steal. Uh, but JOK has just been so good and th got so much better when the Browns actually invested in the defensive tackles uh, in front of him. Yeah, and now Dewan Jones, again, he has to follow up a good year, but if he follows it up with another good year, I, I would certainly say a fourth round with him would be a steal. Jared Mueller, as always, man, appreciate the time and the insight. Uh, thanks very much, Jared. Absolutely, Dave. Always good to talk. Jared Mueller, make sure you check him out. Dogs by Nature, always uh, really good coverage of the Browns, uh, especially uh, now at draft time. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We turn our attention to the Cavaliers. Sam Amico from HoopsWire.com straight ahead. Sports for CLA. Be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. Sports for CLE continues. We turn our attention to the Cavaliers. We know for certain the Cavs are the four seed. They will face the five seed, the Orlando Magic, um, and things will start Saturday at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. Uh, take a look at this note from NBA.com. Cavs and the Magic have played four times during the regular season. They split the season series, each team winning a game on the other's home floor. Three of the four games weren't close. They were decided uh, by double digits. Let's welcome in Sam Amico from HoopsWire.com. Um, uh, Sam, it's kind of best case scenario, a team without a lot of playoff experience in the Magic. That's who the Cavs get in, in the first round. Yeah, I don't think you could draw it up better, Dave, the way that if you're just talking about the first round series, really the Cavs have the most favorable matchup in the whole playoffs. You know, now that's not to take away from the Magic, but it's just the reality of the situation when you think about uh, the teams that are coming in out of the play-in tournament, presumably, are probably going to be the Philadelphia 76ers with Joel Embiid or the Miami Heat, the defending Eastern Conference champions who who play, you know, often their best basketball in the playoffs. Uh, the Cavs instead are getting, you know, with this number four seed, 
the number five seed, the Orlando Magic, wonderful regular season. But yeah, you talk about their core or really their top seven or eight guys are all playoff rookies. So they're very similar to the way the Cavs were last season. You know, you talk about Darius Garland, Isaac Okoro, Evan Mobley, uh, all those guys were playoff rookies. Lavert and Allen barely had uh, any playoff experience. So the Cavs now are coming in a- as the more experienced playoff team, which isn't easy to do because a lot of these guys have only played one round, but that's one round more than the Orlando Magic. Well, And if you look at the numbers, let's take a look. Uh, this is from ESPN.com by the numbers. The, the Magic, you see the record, 47-35, point differential uh, plus Point, uh, 2.6, that's 15th in the NBA offensive rating, almost 113, 22nd. Uh, they're a really good defensive team. Defensive rating, 110.8, that's third. Net rating, 2.2, 14th. Uh, points per game leader, Apollo Banchero, 22.6. And let's quickly look at the Cavs, and, and they're very similar numbers. So, you know, uh, 48 and 34, you see the point differential similar. Offensive rating, 114.716th, defensive rating 112.2, net rating 2.512th, and and Donovan Mitchell um, leading score at 26.6. So uh, the numbers are similar. The thing that surprised me a little bit, Magic defensive net rating is third best, which um, defensive net rating usually equates to playoff success. Yeah, in most situations, uh, you know, one thing, too, they they obviously, Orlando has great size with Banchero, Franz Wagner, Mo Wagner, uh, you know, Wendell Carter Jr. You go right down the list. They've got a lot of talented big players. uh, So I think that that really helps them defensively. Jalen Suggs, uh, one of their starting guards, is one of the top defenders in the NBA, probably a candidate for first team all defense. Uh, So those things, yeah, you're right, Dave. They usually translate well to the NBA playoffs. Now, you know, what the Cavs learned last season was you can't really defend in the regular season or defend in the playoffs the same way you do in the regular season. Uh, The game's much more physical um, and, and the refs let you get away with a lot more. That includes screens on offense. Uh, so, you know, it, it it's going to help Orlando and the Cavs, the fact that they have been among, you know, the two defensive stalwart teams uh, during the regular season. But so much of, of the NBA playoffs, and again, I'm not writing off Orlando here because I don't want it to come back to haunt me. But so much of the NBA playoffs is experience. You look at the teams that are in the finals year after year after year are the veteran teams. And that's where the Cavs are going to have, presumably, at least on paper, a massive advantage in this series. All right. This from uh, ESPN.com as well. Playoff um, outlook for the Cavs. Biggest concern. Health is Cleveland's top question, particularly regarding Mitchell. Um, has missed 15 of his last 21 games, managing a left knee issue. Even when he's played, he has averaged just 14.3 points a game, 33.3% uh, shooting during those six games. Um, Sam, that, without question, that, that is fair. Um, he has looked better later in the season, though, if, if, you're, if you're looking for a positive. <laughs> Yeah, he looked great in the last two games that he played, looked entirely healthy. You know, to me, the biggest thing about the Cavs that's a positive going into the playoffs is the fact that they needed to beat Indiana Pacers last Friday. That was that was a playoff game, basically. And it, it was a one-game playoff. Because if Cavs had lost, we'd be talking about them probably as the sixth seed right now playing the Milwaukee Bucks, having to go to Milwaukee. Uh, but instead... They won that game, and Mitchell was obviously brilliant in that game, carried them uh, so much. They played like they played in January a lot. You know, when they won 17 of 18 to kick off the new year, They that's what they look like in that game against the Pacers. So to me, even though they've been very uneven and, and kind of clunky since the All-Star break and that Mitchell's been in and out of the lineup, to me that Pacers game showed, okay, 
we're you know we're ready to go uh if you're the Cavs you're feeling healthy you're feeling confident you got a favorable matchup on paper against an inexperienced team so I think this week off too uh between the regular season and the start of the playoffs is going to help them heal quite a bit but uh that game against Indiana to me Mitchell looked back to his old self uh as well as the game he played before that so uh, I think that's really a, a huge key, obviously, uh, going into a series against a young young opponent. Well, same article from ESPN. What to watch in the first round. Mitchell versus the Magic defense led on the perimeter by Jalen Suggs, who you talked about. Two win- in the Cavs, two wins over the Magic. Mitchell averaged 30 points on 48.8% shooting, 44.4% from three. Uh, with nine and a half assists and five rebounds. It was during that time when when they were playing well. In the Magic's two wins, Mitchell sat out one game entirely and was held to 22 points, six of 18 shooting with three assists in the other. Man, when you you look at that, that screams Donovan Mitchell is the key in this series. I, I don't think there's any other way to look at it. Yeah, well, and if you think about last season, the New York Knicks blitzed him in terms of running two, sometimes three defenders at him. And uh, really, I I don't want to say took him out of the series, but removed him from being an NBA all-star in that series. You know, I I suspect that the Magic may try something similar. The difference is the Magic just don't have as many proven uh, defenders on the wing to to kind of slow him down. And I, I think that's if they should even try that, they may just try and play, J, you know, Jalen Suggs on Mitchell straight up. And you know what? Suggs will give you, Mitchell's going to have to work. And then if he gets past Suggs, he's probably got three, six, ten, and up guys standing there waiting for him. So, yeah, I, I mean, Mitchell's going to be the key to the whole thing. But I, I will say one sign of promise is he's had a, a career year in terms of assists and facilitating for others. Uh, I, I think that he's just gotten more comfortable this year with his Cavs teammates uh, than he was last season. So he's probably not going to have to score as much. It, it's going to be up to the other guys to deliver. And uh, certainly the Cavs on paper have the talent to do that against a team like Orlando. So I, I, I think you're right, Dave. It's, you know, Donovan Mitchell's, the Cavs are going to go as Donovan Mitchell goes but I suspect he's going to have a much better playoff showing uh, this year than he did last. All right, uh, final thing from that article. One postseason prediction. Cavs will take down the Magic in six or fewer. Magic had an excellent season behind a tough defense and relying on Paolo Banchero to provide the offense. In the playoffs, though, Cavs have more scoring from the perimeter in addition to their defensive big men. You know, Sam, it's especially – true this year. Nyang adds something. Struess adds something. And, and I think those guys will be magnified in, in a series. Um, what do you think? Just the keys to this series when you look at it. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's, you know, the Cavs did add veterans. Max Struess obviously went to the finals. These guys are all X factors or guys who are going to help in the locker room that weren't on the team last year. Max Struess got to the finals. Uh, George Yang has a lot of playoff experience with the Sixers and and the Jazz before that. Um, And and then you think about the guys who may or may not play just being in the locker room. Tristan Thompson's a new addition. He's been an invaluable voice during his during his suspension. When he came back, you know, a lot of the Cavs were saying, uh, you know, it's such a big boost to have him back. And I I was kind of like, yeah, really? And they were like, no, no, it's all about his leadership and him, his instruction and, you know, just him helping guys while they're on the court. Tristan's almost almost like a coach on the court. And then the addition of Marcus Morris, too, who's, you know, was signed for the rest of the season. Another veteran guy who's been around the block and, and understands the playoffs. So I think that, yeah, it's it's just a different element to it. As far as that post there, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think the Cavs, you know, should be able to make fairly quick work of this series if they're playing uh, even their even their B B minus level game, and that's 
no disrespect to the Magic, but they're almost like an eight seed this year. All right, before I let you go, when you look at it, what are some things you want to see that would be good signs moving forward um, from the Cavs, assuming they're going to advance? What, what do you need to see against the Magic to feel like, all right, they got at least a puncher's chance uh, against the Celtics, who presumably, presumably would be next? Yeah, I, I, I think that the best thing that you can hope for from them is, number one with the Cavs, would be – you know, I don't think their defense is really ever in question. Uh, obviously, that needs to be up to par uh, in the playoffs. But, you know, the ball has to move, which has been kind of up and down since the All-Star break. Uh, they, they've seemed almost a little bit out of sorts offensively since the All-Star break, and that may have something to do with Mitchell coming in and out of the lineup. Uh, but it, regardless, now he's here. You have to move the ball better than you have been since February. And, and I think, you know, a huge, huge thing is going to be playing with an edge and, and being physical. Unlike you were last year in the playoffs against the Knicks, you've got to bring that edginess this year because you can get away with stuff in the playoffs. You can be more physical. And I think that they've learned that lesson from last season and being pushed around by New York and you know it's their turn to go in and play with an edge play with confidence be physical and uh, you know I think that's that's going to be a huge factor in if they're able to get beyond the second round is just you know not that whole not back down mentality. Sam Amico HoopsWire.com as always great stuff appreciate the time and the insight thanks very much Sam. All right, Dave, thanks for having me. We'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Sam Amico, HoopsWire.com. Check him out. Uh, great stuff uh, with the Cavs and the entire NBA as it is playoff time in the National Basketball Association. That's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLE. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Have a great night, everybody. See you tomorrow at 4 on Sports for CLE.